Welcome back to Painting Ace Vaughan. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about how to paint wood, and we'll be using the Adendri Ranger. Now, you better get used to painting wood, because in this game, there is a whole variety of models, including the Ranger, the Grove Maiden, the Sentinels, and the Guardian, that are all comprised entirely of wood. And you'll find it in a lot of other models as well. The good news is that wood is actually one of the more easy surfaces to paint as there's a lot of natural variation within wood texture as well as wood color. So we're gonna be using a technique called wet blending. So wet blending is simply the process of adding the paint to the figure whilst it's still wet, manipulating it on the model. Now I haven't talked about wet blending a lot on this series before and the reason is it's not a technique that I use a lot. But one thing it's really great for is creating natural variation. And that's something you see a lot in wood. So we're gonna use it for this and maybe occasionally for surfaces like fur, somewhere where you want to create something unusual. For the overlay color on the Ranger, we are of course using brown. In this case, it's a dark desaturated brown. Let's get started. So here you can see the dark brown color that I've chosen for the overlay. Unfortunately, the coverage that I get even through the airbrush isn't as opaque as I would normally like. This sometimes would cause a problem, but in this case, it's not going to be an issue as there is a lot of layers to come. So you'll have probably noticed at this stage that I do like to start my process by adding a lot of colors out onto my wet palette. I find it's really nice to be able to go back and forth between colors wherever I need them, whenever I need them. And it creates a, a little bit more variation in your colors and in your figure to have something a little more unique than just your standard out of the bottle color. Color mixing is something I will talk a little bit about in a future episode. Um, but for this one, we will just commence with the very first layer. So wood is an amazing texture and this sculpt and many of the sculpts in this range that have wood are easily some of the most well sculpted and subtle shapes and textures that you'll find in the range. So this means we don't need to do an awful lot to add this, this texture ourselves as most of the hard work's been done by the figure. Having said that, never hurts to incorporate brush strokes into your layers as this continues to reinforce the shapes and the volume itself. So with wood, we want to continue the shape that the sculpt already has and do brush strokes that naturally follow these contours and these shapes. So I'm probably going a little bit heavier with this layer than I would have normally gone and that's related to the overlay color being a little on the transparent side. So this process that we're using for wood follows a very similar step-by-step -step to a lot of the other processes I do. So we're going to build up several layers of paint, creating texture and creating a value change. And then we're going to use a contrast paint or a saturated glaze to re-add the intensity of color. So this process we're going to follow is a little different to leather and we're going to use a lot more contrast paint in the later stages to really reinforce the color intensity of the wood. We're going to apply some blending on the model using multiple contrast paints. So this figure is a really cool sculpt as I've said. There's a lot of different elements that fuse into each other. So this fabric here is quite distinct but then there's elements of it that have little tendrils and branches so rather than trying to isolate each specific element what I've tried to do is have everything feel like it's a unified singular piece and we're going to actually allow the green and the browns to bleed into each other so this is not precisely wet in wet yet but we will be using this sort of pr approach later on in the piece where we actually blend the green and the brown together on the figure. 
So I'm using the green to try and pinpoint armor, to try and pinpoint specific areas on the model that have a different type of texture than the wood. But again, this is not a process where I'm trying to be really precise and highlight and isolate each of these different areas. Because this model has so many interesting forms and shapes, it allows for this really varied and natural approach. One of the key parts in this process will come later on down the track when we really look to separate these sections with a little bit of black lining. So black lining is a process where you take a dilute black or dark brown and you use a very fine brush and you trace a line between two areas. What this does is it reinforces that there are two separate volumes. It's an important step as it will help to create visual break between each of the sections. So here we move into the second layer of highlighting and we're again using red leather. This is one of my favorite colors in case you hadn't guessed. I think I've used it on most figures now. And again, trying to consider those volumes, trying to follow the direction of the sculpt and we're also at this stage starting to pay attention to the zenithal light, which I've talked about in a lot of previous episodes and making sure that the placement of the lights is consistent with the zenithal prime. So you can also see that with this red leather, I am allowing it to bleed into the green. We're not focusing on trying to have everything be perfect. We're really placing the paint pretty much anywhere where we want to see a highlight and not too concerned about any carryover of the green. As I said in the introduction, wood has an incredible amount of natural variation. And I think any time humans try to create something natural and chaotic, our brains automatically want to make things conform and make things feel even. We like structure, we like order. So this, in many ways, is about breaking out of that structural and ordered approach to nature and allowing for the figure itself to have a whole lot of variability, similar in a way to painting stone. So here I'm mixing a yellow ochre into this green and we're just creating some highlights on the green. Now I normally wouldn't do this at the same time and, and highlight brown and green at the same time, but because of the approach we're taking to this figure and the sensation of harmony that we want it to have, I'm alternating between these colors to really create that unified, unusual, combined color. There is certainly a, a lot more focus on the green on these armor plate elements and there's certainly a lot more focus of brown on the wood elements. But as you can see, there's always additions of little colors here and there. So I've just grabbed a little bit of red leather on the tip of my brush there, and I've added it onto the figure. And then I've grabbed some of the green and we're mixing those two colors together on the actual figure. So this in essence is wet blending and what we're doing is we're allowing the colors to blend together on the figure and this creates that really unusual and natural variation so we're moving into AK pistachio here as a highlight color this is a great color really saturated really vibrant I like it for a lot of different applications here we're using it for highlighting on the green we're also targeting some of these little branches and little vine elements to again really bring out a little bit of focus on those areas. And now we're going to again do a highlight on the brown. You can see here again that wet blending where we're taking the color, mixing it in with the green on the actual figure. This is a, a really easy process to get right. 
as much as it might be a bit scary the first time you do it, what you're looking for is for the paint to work on the figure almost independently of what you're doing. The trick is not using paint that is too dilute. This dilute paint won't absorb and blend together. What will happen is it will run into each other and it will run into the recesses, which is not what we want. So here we are starting to add some real defined highlights to the wood and you can see there's a lot more precision of brush stroke. We are again trying to follow that shape of the sculpt, really trying to lean into the texture, leaning into where we want our focal points to be. And we are going to use a contrast paint at the end to soften these transitions and re-add the intensity of color. I think it's a natural feeling to be a little bit worried about going too high with your highlights. But as I've said in previous episodes, when you take a model out from underneath your painting light and put it on a table, all of those super smooth blends that you think looked great under your painting light usually are very hard to distinguish on a table. So over contrast, really vibrant, bright highlights will help your model stand out and it will make for a more exciting and fun tabletop experience. So this figure is really starting to take shape now and you can see how those elements of green are interacting with the elements of brown. It's adding a lot of harmony and creating some really nice shades and nuances in this color. So we're going to go into a almost highlight now. I'm always mixing in a little bit of yellow or a little bit of that yellowish tinge into these colors because I do want it to feel like a warmer palette. If you just go with a pure white, you can find it looks a little too cold. This highlight here is very clearly focused on the raised areas, on areas that are going to catch more light. And we are really focused on the direction of the brush stroke to reinforce the natural texture of the wood. I think these legs are a really great example of what I'm talking about with this type of approach because you can clearly see the brush strokes, you can clearly see each of the sculpted elements as well as the brush stroke elements all tying into this shape. It's always a really freeing experience painting with a wet in wet approach because rather than being concerned about colors fusing together you're actually looking to achieve that result and it creates a much more interesting end result. So this highlight color because of that yellow is tending a little bit towards green which is absolutely fine. We want to see these two colors feel pretty unified and harmonious by the end of this process. Now one of the more challenging areas on this figure to paint is actually the face. It has no mouth, which makes things look a little bit unusual. Looks like she's wearing a mask sometimes in some of the sculpts, but there's still a clearly defined eye socket, clearly defined forehead, and those areas are where we want to draw the most focus that we can, because those are the elements that create a contrast between the eye socket and the forehead. All right, final light, and you can see we also reinforce the green with a little bit of pistachio. Here we're just doing the light this is just AK off white. This is very precise strokes. We're not looking to add this to every element. Being a little more deliberate with these brush strokes. And the reason I enjoy using contrast paints and this approach is it's really hard to get it wrong. 
initially when the contrast paints were marketed what you found was people were expecting to paint them over a white a pure white and have a finished result and in some cases that works in some figures in some colors that does come out okay but it's been my experience that when you do this underlying work this underlying build up of stages you're not asking as much of the contrast paints of, of the of the glaze to actually do that heavy lifting what you're asking for it to do is create a filter over the layers and this is something that those colors and inks in general are absolutely excel at it's just tweaking the overall palette into a different color range so i find this much easier and much more foolproof using an overlay like a contrast paint or an ink we do have a really clearly defined value contrast now between the darkest browns and this white and it's really helping to make the figure pop when you apply contrast paint over an already highlighted area it will have the effect of filtering the color but it will also reduce the value of the highest highlight and increase the value of the darkest darks so it's important that you over contrast at this stage as you are going to lose some of that contrast when we do this overlay of a saturated contrast paint so you can see i'm mixing three contrast paints here on my palette we have a green we have a brown and we also have a turquoise and what we're doing over the wood and over all elements on this figure is actually mixing the two contrast paints or all three contrast paints together there's no rhyme or reason here we're allowing the colors to bleed into each other i think it's really fun and freeing and easy to do the only call out i would make is that you want to tend more towards a thicker layer of contrast paint as opposed to a dilute layer of contrast paint to allow these colors to bleed together i've mixed in a little bit of the medium i use which is joe sonia magic mix this just allows the paints a little bit more time before they start to dry and it will allow you to work the colors together a little bit better so you can see i apply one color and then I grab another color from the palette and apply it next to it, allowing the two to bleed together. It's a foolproof process. You can't get it wrong. All of the, the contrast paints are doing all of the work for you. It's tremendous. I am tending more towards brown on the wood elements and green on the green elements but the two are bleeding together in all of these areas and it's helping to reinforce that sense of natural variation now these contrast paints are some of the more vibrant ones there's some really great colors in there any intense chestnut any intense green pigment will work what i have found is that to really get a great end result sometimes you want to do several layers of this approach and for the impatient ones out there my secret one of my secrets is to use a hairdryer so once I've painted all of this with these contrast paints I'm then going to use a hairdryer to dry these areas really really quickly and then I'll do another coat. It's a fantastic speed trick, the hairdryer. I use it quite a lot. If you've watched any of my streams or seen any of the full paint throughs on these figures, you'll often see me whip out the hairdryer and help the drying process along. So all these colors fusing together, 
on all of these different areas is helping to create this fantastic sense of harmony on the figure as well as variation. So we'll allow this to dry with the hairdryer and then we'll go again and we'll really try and reinforce the intensity of this color. So these are almost undiluted just to really punch up the vibrancy and the saturation of these colors. I think this approach is very straightforward. I think painters with you know, not a lot of experience miniature painting can really get a handle on this approach. It works a little bit better in my experience rather than just using the contrast paints straight over the basic white because you do have that little bit of extra detail that's making the figures look uh, much more refined. And that brings to a close this episode. I hope you've enjoyed a little insight into painting wood. In the next episode, we're going to be focusing on fur. And for that, there's only one model we could choose. It is, of course, the Ursus Warbear. I hope you'll join me then. I'll see you in the next episode. Big Tano.